Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today I've got a real treat for you and it was also a real treat for me. I'm interviewing the composer and musician Rob Simonson from the United States. So, I actually only recently came across his work when I was listening to his new album called Reveries. And uh, I use it when I'm running, I use it when I'm meditating, it's just absolutely beautiful music to listen to. And I'm going to put the link in the show notes for where you guys can find that as well. Uh, But I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rob and then we'll jump straight into this interview because there's a lot of great stuff in the interview for you guys to hear. So, composer, producer, multi-instrumentalist, artist and co-founder of the LA artist collective The Echo Society, Rob Simonson has contributed to almost 100 film and television soundtracks in the two decades since he was first asked to provide piano solos for a film made by high school friends. Having developed a presence in the Portland independent circuit with his first formal commission, West Ender, he was then invited to assist veteran composer Michael Dana, and in 2004 relocated to Los Angeles, where he contributed music to Dana's Academy Award-winning score for 2012's Life of Pi, as well as Surf's Up, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, and Moneyball. He and Dana also co-scored the music for 500 Days of Summer in 2009, helping to establish Simonson as a sought-after talent in his own right. Since then, Simonson's composed music for 2015's The Age of Adeline, for which he co-wrote the end credits theme, in addition to a slew of other films, including The Spectacular Now, The Foxcatcher, Tully, Love, Simon, and Captive State. In addition to this, Simonson launched his own solo artist career in 2019 with his full-length debut album, Reveries, for Sony Masterworks. So, man, such an interesting, uh, spectacular array of experience here that we get to, uh, to learn from in our interview today, and I'm so excited for you guys to listen to this. So, without any further ado, I introduce you to my guest today, Rob Simonson. Okay, so Rob, I'm uh, I'm really excited to have you here, man. And and uh, you know, <clears throat> the reason I reached out to you, as I said in the email, was uh, with this podcast. I'm not only looking to talk to people who are specifically involved in the philosophical arena, but people involved in you know all kinds of arenas uh, that that is basically their expression of their philosophy of life. Uh, and I kind of see you as a, almost as a philosopher of music. It's, you know, your music has just been so valuable to me and, um, and so inspiring and, and, and beautiful. And, and I actually had no idea as we've been talking before the interview that you've been interested in stoicism to some degree in your life. So we'll have to touch on that seeing as I had absolutely no idea that that was the case, but I want to give you a little bit of a chance to, you know, tell myself and the audience a little bit about yourself and then we'll just jump in and, and see where we go. Ah, cool. Well, I'm very honored to hear that. Um, uh, yeah, I music for me was always something a bit of a retreat away from the world into myself. There were pianos in my homes growing up and my grandmother was a music teacher. And so music was around and I really developed my own relationship with the piano. I took piano lessons, but was a fairly terrible student. <clears throat> um, for better or worse, I just wanted to do my thing with it. And I didn't want it to turn into a, a thing where I was practicing and it, it was about discipline and it was about playing other people's music. I remember my, I was just, sitting and noodling around on the piano one night and my grandmother said, don't you want to learn how to play other people's music? And I thought, no, (laughs) it's Mm -hmm. such a strange thing. 
I realize now at this point in my career, that's a fairly foolish attitude to take uh, a bit of a, uh, there's a bit of hubris in there. Um, and there's so much that you do learn from studying other people's music and learning how to play other people's music. And that's actually how you improve. Uh, it helps you develop your ear. It helps you develop your technique. It opens you to new ideas. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's like reading a book basically. And if, if you can read, it's, saying like, oh, I don't want to read other people's stories. I just want to write my own. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a childish uh, childish approach on that. But that's, that's, that's how it was for me when I was younger. And I, I did take lessons and studied jazz piano in college and eventually studied some theory and harmony and um, took some private lessons and tried to develop myself. Because once I started scoring films, um, you know, my weaknesses were laid before me. So I've tried to make up for those with self-study and study with private teachers and um, just trying to become better and uh, develop competence because I didn't grow up playing orchestras. I didn't grow up with classical training people rapping you on the fingers when you messed up. It was just kind of me at the piano. Um, but on a positive note, I, I do think that that tether is, is still there for me. And it's, it's a deeply personal connection to, to music. And, um, and it's for me, I've, I've had so many powerful experiences listening to music um, that it just draws me like a moth to the flame. So I just want to play in that sandbox and whether or not anyone else gets anything out of it, I'm just grateful that I've been able to continue doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, I suppose that's a bit of a, a background on my kind of musical upbringing. Yeah. And, and there's, there's so much that I want to touch on already based on what you've said. So I'm probably just going to throw away my question sheet here because <laughs> you, you know, this this whole idea of you have to learn what your musical ancestors have brought to the table in order to find your own, as cheesy as it sounds, in, in order to find your own voice on the piano, right? Like there's, there's a delicate balance there that almost mimics how we relate to culture and society. It's like we, we know that culture and society needs to improve and change, but you don't just come as a 16 year old and say, I have all of the answers for how to create the ideal utopian version of what I want in society. Right. And it's the same with, with, with music. You have to have that humility, but you know, you build that relationship, like you said, with the instrument. And, and I think of somebody, uh, you know, we're both jazz musicians, different levels. I will admit that <laughs> I'm not even close to, to, to your level of understanding of music, but you know, we might see somebody like Herbie Hancock, for example, and say, there's no way that you can teach somebody to have that kind of a relationship with the instrument, right? That's something that comes purely as a result of, of building that relationship how did you further develop that relationship with the instrument? Uh, and I guess a side question is you, you could have just grown up and taken the easy route of getting a job. You could have just grown up and taken the easy route of, of not necessarily following your, uh, your nature as a person to, to do music as your language. So how did you develop that, that relationship? And also why did you decide to take that risk and, and, choose music as your language through which you'd, you'd speak to the world. There's a lot there. There is a lot uh, there. <laughs> it, well, as a little anecdote just popped into my head when I was in college studying jazz piano and playing in a kind of jam band, jazz fusion band. I went to go see Herbie Hancock when he they released their Return to the Headhunters album and they were playing live. So the trumpet player from the band and I went and I just was so, Herbie is one of my, you know, luminaries. Um, 
he's so talented and so tasteful and he's been involved in so many amazing projects over the years. So here's, you know, one of my heroes. And I remember I somehow weaseled myself backstage <clears throat> and I wanted to meet Herbie and I don't know why anyone let me back there. <laughs> Uh, maybe there was some connection with somebody at the door that knew the band that I was in. We were just a really small little local band, but um, somehow found myself in the green room with Herbie Hancock and I was just frozen. <laughs> I, was like, I don't know what to, what do you say? And he was just sitting there. Just, I don't remember if he was maybe smoking a cigarette or he's had a drink Maybe it was water or just, I, I don't remember anything. I just remember him sitting there and I was just a few feet from him. And I just thought, well, what do I say? And, but I wanted, what I wanted was a, an apprenticeship. You know, I wanted a mentor. And I remember I, I, they were packing up and I had a minute to speak to his tour manager. And I said, you know, can I, I would be willing to do anything to join the tour and just hang with Herbie and learn and, and uh, do whatever he needed to have done. And I don't think the guy had any idea of the band that I was playing in or what I was doing. And he just said, look, man, Herbie has his thing and you've got your thing and you should just follow that. And I was, it, you know, it would have been, I was confused because I thought, well, he doesn't have any idea what my thing is. <laughs> Maybe he would tell me to go to school or get another kind of job <laughs> if he did. But for whatever reason, it was kind of the perfect advice that I got at that time. And it helped me to continue focusing on doing my own thing. You know, I think that we have this idea that the answers are going to come from somewhere else. Um, have you seen the razor's edge that Bill Murray I, movie? I haven't actually no. Um, I know but I'm sure some people in the audience have so, and, and well, I'd, I'd definitely be interested. Well, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but the whole point is, is a bit about realizing that you, that the answers are not going to come from something outside of yourself, kind of that there are no answers. Hmm. And you're, we're all just kind of imp improvising. That's not to say that there aren't a lot of people that have true wisdom. It's not to say there aren't skills that you can develop or real world ways that you can learn. But I, I think that <clears throat> taking control of your own development is, um, that's a really crucial part of, of a person's evolution, I think. Um, so that, that helped me settle in and, and focus more on my own thing. And then fast forward to, uh, years later, I actually got what I wanted in Michael Dana, who was my film composing mentor that I worked with for five years. And he has a degree in composition and is very learned and, uh, was an organ player in his church growing up and, um, he's become a, a really huge influence on me and a very dear friend. And he let me work up the ranks underneath him. And I started assisting, which, you know, buying him computer gear and setting it up and making tea and doing everything that an assistant does. And he gave me musical opportunities that, um, kind of built on the previous and he let me work up. And I remember at one point years in, he said something to me that stuck with me a lot, which is, he said to me, you're not as scared as you should be. Which at the moment, I just, <laughs> it's still, it's still, a, it's a very gray comment. It's not black and white. It's not clearly negative. It's not clearly positive. Because in that is, is courage <laughs> or maybe stupidity. You know, it mm. might be blind, uh, you know, blind, um, you know, courage is like being afraid and doing something anyway. Mm -hmm. 
and this is more like maybe I don't know the danger, <laughs> but I'm going ahead anyway, you know, just like s- swimming with sharks and not even knowing what a shark is. Hmm. Um, so I, you know, I think if, if the, the fact that I'm still standing today and still, you know, creating music on a, as a, as a profession is I think a testament to, um, being very lucky <laughs> hmm. and, uh, and also just being willing to just jump in. And that's not to say that I didn't learn a tremendous amount from Michael, that I didn't take from him a lot of, you know, I would, when you, when you have a mentor, you're kind of under their wing and you get to experience everything that they're going through, but your ass isn't in the hot seat, you know, um, for the, for the job. So you get to see how they handle it and you get to think about how I might handle it, what I might do differently or what I might do the same. And it's a experience that I would, I would wish and hope for anyone who wanted it. And I, I value it greatly. Mm. And, um, and Michael was always trying to find angles in with his work, intellectual angles. And that's something that I really picked, I took from him as well, was trying to find a kind of intellectual frame for how you approach a score. It helps you set up rules. It helps you to kind of draw a map. Um, And so, you know, I think these things have have really been kind of, I don't know, crucial to my development. I don't even remember what your question was and I hope that I answered it in some regard. Um, But yeah. No, you definitely did. And actually I I already had written down here that I wanted to discuss uh, your, your kind of um, apprenticeship with, with Michael because and so much great stuff in, in that story about Herbie and then, you know, moving on to, to apprenticeship with, with Michael. And it speaks to this, uh, this massive hubris that young musicians have, right? Like I've heard so many of those stories of musicians. They'll go to a concert of this mega star and then they'll just push past security and try to get out back to meet them. And, and it, it's, it's, it seems to work in a very similar manner to the way that, uh, you know, when we study philosophy, for example, we look at uh, these these great philosophers of the past and, and the people who turned out to be the, the best philosophers were always those ones who had apprenticeship with with another great philosopher before them. And and that philosopher had just absolutely crushed this person and, and you know, you need to be like this, you need to be like that. And it's very similar within the musical community in that, and especially within jazz, as as I'm sure you can you can attest to like we look to our musical mentors above us and we really try to get as close to them as possible so that we can get something from them so take something from them and learn from them and oftentimes if you jump in a in a jam session at a at a jazz bar and there's some really incredible jazz musicians who are playing on that stage they will do everything that they can to crush your spirit (laughs) and show you that you're not scared enough, right? That you don't know enough and you should be scared and you should be looking to constantly improve because if you don't, then you're not respecting the art form of music, right? How important is it that element of, I don't want to say crushing your soul, but that element of, of showing younger people below you and receiving from your mentors that, that, crushing advice that you need to you need to focus more you need to be more scared you need to do better because you're respecting the art like that Mm -hmm. yeah uh, well that's the that's how charlie parker became charlie parker right he at least the story as i heard it is he went up on a you know on a stage and played and i forget who it was but someone threw a symbol at his head right and almost took his head off. Yeah. And jazz is full of those kinds of stories. Jazz musicians are brutal. Yeah. And that's what the movie Whiplash is all about. Right. And he had a chair thrown at his head in a scene. And I, you know, that it's, 
Charlie Parker then was so destroyed and so devastated that he went home and all of that shame and embarrassment and anger and whatever it is, that cocktail that, that he was experiencing, that drove him to practice his ass off every day and to become one of the greatest saxophonists of all time. And he, you know, I story goes, he shows up a year later and he plays and then he's playing one of the most amazing solos of all time. Right. So, you know, and other people talk about this and I think it's true that there's a kind of, uh, when you're, when you're angry and your, your soul wants to kind of resist being crushed, that can be amazing fuel for development. And, you know, to, to be honest, it's, it's something that I've avoided, you know, I, I like, I, I very much, I'll just admit, you know, I did not go through that soul crushing experience and work hard enough to become, you know, if there's a jam session going on, I'm not going to stand up. I, you know, it's like the last time I did that, I'm still gnawing with the, the, the bitter <laughs> shame of how, how much my, you know, my chops have gone down over the years. And um, I just was not hanging at all. And I could just feel the ire from the other musicians. And it's, you know, it's a very competitive thing, but you can use that. And I think that that's a really valid way for people to find you know, it's grist for the mill if one chooses to apply it. And I think that it, it can really reveal to people where they truly are in their capacity um, to chew through discomfort to try to achieve something greater, to try to achieve something that you, there's no other way to get it except to go through discomfort. Mm. Um, and I've, found my own ways of pulling myself through those kind of fields of discomfort, but it's not in becoming a jazz master of, you know, or just even really able, able to hang. I've, I chose to kind of have the safety of my studio. Um, uh, and I get, I get challenged, you know, in, in plenty of ways all the time, but I, you know, if you would have asked me when I was 20, I would have said like, ah, you know, you don't need any of that. And I mean, it just depends on <laughs> how long you maintain that before it's a matter of time that you kind of get smacked in the face by just the reality that you haven't done the work, you haven't developed your skills. And it's not that you can't, it's just a matter of what's your stomach for it. Um, how, you know, how long can you delay gratification? How much can you just show up and put the work in and trust that doing that is going to take you somewhere? Um, and coming back to, to what I think your first question was, you know, there, there is an established body of knowledge and to show up on a stage and, and be, and, and have, have the hubris to, to just sass around and do your thing without really having any knowledge or control over the craft. Um, it can be, it can be an embarrassment. That being said, um, some of the most popular artists of all time are not trained musicians hmm. or they're self-taught, you know, I mean, Bob Dylan, there's a lot of folk musicians and the people in other areas, jazz is, Jazz and classical music are kind of, they're, they're a bit more under lock and key and you have to put in a lot of work to be able to hang. But um, I mean, there, there's voices of, in folk music or pop music that have arguably had a massive, way more massive impact. So there's examples of people that maybe didn't go through a formal training process and yet they've, had an impact on the culture and has a jazz musician or a classical musician that has spent their entire lives getting a degree of proficiency in their craft. Do they have an impact on culture? 
there's multiple ways of, of, of viewing it and, and viewing what it is that you actually want to achieve, where you want to put your time and where you want to put your energy and, and how you want to be impacted by your pursuit and how you might want to impact others through your pursuit. So I, I don't, I don't think it's simple, but definitely with jazz and classical music, <laughs> um, there's there's a cannon and it's guarded and the people that are in there have fought their own battles and worked very hard to be able to do what they get to do so i understand the the ire that's aroused when someone who can't hang wants to get up and be on the stage it's just like look you haven't earned it you mm. haven't earned it look at what the rest of us had to do um so you know there there's when, when people work for me and I try to mentor people that assist me or whatever, um, you know, I do try to impress upon them the general sense of uh, delayed gratification and being willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Always bring your A game. Um, push yourself to have a vision about something. It's, I think it's in more of a conceptual way mm -hmm. rather than saying, um, you know, you need to be able to do, you know, eight species counterpoint exercises forwards and backwards and, you know, those, those kind of regular metrics. I think those would apply more if you were a composition student or if you were in academia, but we live in a world where technology provides access for people that may or may not have kind of earned the right um, to wield them in the way that they do. And, and look, it just unashamedly, I'm more in that camp than I am in the learned camp. And I, I, I won't hide that. It's not that I, I'm not ashamed about it. It's not that I'm not looking to improve upon it, but I'm willing to admit that I am more in that camp. And, um, and I think that as I, the older I get, the more I do wish that I would have spent more of my young years delaying the gratification. Mm -hmm. And, really honing the, the, the skills and sitting at the feet of the masters and, and studying them on much deeper levels and chewing that and absorbing that into my system because I think that whatever I then wanted to turn around and say as an artist would be that much more powerful. Hmm. Um, but that is, that is a viewpoint that I've, I've evolved to, not, not one that I started out with. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I I love everything that you're saying there. It really does speak. And, and you know, what, what you're saying there is such a humble thing for you to say, because, you, you know, you're, you're a, a producer, you know, you're a composer and producer in, in Hollywood. You've worked on some major movies, um, beautiful music. And, and what you create is, is so stunning. But still, you put yourself in the camp of people who hasn't yet, you know, like, like being crushed like that. And, and, and it's, and it's almost like that's just a musician thing, right? That there's such a humility in every musician. I hate listening to anything that I've recorded. I can't stand it because and my mind and, 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 you know, I understand that I'm on a completely lower level, but, but even somebody like yourself comes out and says, you know, man, I need to be so much better. And I think that that speaks to the fact that in music, especially, there is always somebody who is so much better than you, right? There's always somebody who is just crushing it on a completely different level. And that for, for the real musician, for somebody who wants to uh, really make a splash in the industry, that doesn't serve to crush their spirit. It serves to motivate them that I need to be way better. Cause if I don't, then somebody's going to be so much better than me. And it reminds me of something that my musical mentor over here it tells me regularly, which is that in Australia, there seems to be this confidence within music that is kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's unwarranted because he, he came, well, he, he studied in, in, in Indiana. Right. And so he says that somebody at the top of their game over here 
might think, wow, I'm doing so well. And they have that confidence, but then they go to America and there's somebody sitting on the side of a street who plays better than them, right? Like America is just that place where every street corner has somebody who is so much better than you at music and they're just sitting there playing. And, and I think that, that so much of us need that, that, that humility to say that I'm never going to be as good as I could be but as long as I keep on looking up and I, I, I want to, I want to talk about your creative process. Cause you know, we've kind of been getting to that, you know, we, we've talked about kind of your upbringing and your, uh, how you decided to, to keep it going. And, you know, I listened to your album, uh, yeah, Reveries. I, I want to make sure I pronounce that right, but it's been absolutely exquisite to me over the past few months listening to that and just, just, you know, experiencing how beautiful that album is. But, what's your creative process from start to finish? You know, I don't know how long that'll take you to tell me, but, but how, how do you work through creating such a, such a beautiful piece of art? Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I have to credit um, my, my team with the process of the record. I had been hired to score a French film in 2016, I think and 2015 2016 and i went over and uh the music supervisor on the film is a music producer named uh, rafael hamburger and he's the son of france gall and michel berger who are these two french pop music luminaries michel berger was a producer and composer and arranger and worked with so many famous people. Um, and France Gall is one of France's most beloved uh, female pop singers. And mm. So he grew up in the studios of France and I got hired on this film. He was the music supervisor and he also owns a beautiful studio in Saint Germain in France and it's amazing. And I went over there and uh, I met the engineer, Stan Neff and, and Raphael and the three of us along with the director, we just worked for a month making this score for this film. And I lived there and um, this was like a dream come true. I always wanted to travel the world and make music and when those two things can combine, it's, it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> and towards the end of that process, I really loved working with them so much. And we all had the same idea that I should come back and we should just make some piano recordings just, just for their own sake. And I'd always thought about doing a record and I, I didn't really know how because I'm so used to being given a deadline and given a target and like, here's your film, here's what you gotta do, here's how many minutes, here's what we need it by, here's what it needs to feel like, et cetera. And that really has always helped me to finish things. So thinking about doing a record, I, I didn't really know where to begin. And so this seemed like a, a, a great way in. So I went there and we discovered this beautiful piano and we had a bunch of pianos all mic'd up and kind of took over the studio for a number of weeks. And we talked a lot about how we wanted things to feel. I was very clear about how I wanted things to feel. And that's really all I went in with. I didn't go in with any compositions pre-written. It was all just, I know what I want this to feel like. And I knew that I wanted it to be, a reliable record you know I like records that take you to a certain place and they sustain you in that place for the whole duration it's not like oh here's our fast song here's our slow song it's they're just consistent with their vibe um, Beck Sea Change is an album that I, I always think about that has that kind of quality or Aphex Twin selected Ambient Works volume 2 um, these are records that when I want to feel the way that they make me feel, or I want to feel something in myself, I can put those records on and I'm just, I'm taken there. Kind of Blue, you know, Miles Davis has that effect. Um, so for me, it was just 
I'm going to go and I'm going to try to scratch at that feeling, scratch at that vibe. And so we had microphones on these pianos and I would just go out and improvise um, sometimes for an hour, hour and a half at a time. And it would just be about me trying to connect with that feeling in myself and express that musically or find it, hunt it out on the piano, which is very much what I did when I was growing up. So in a, in a lot of ways, it was a return to how I formed my relationship with the piano and with music when I was young. And then I would come into the booth and we would listen back and we would flag things that we thought were interesting and listen back. And then we would take those nuggets and say, oh, we really like this. This is a really good one. And then I would go back out and start building a structure and the, the engineer, Stan, who was also a, a co-producer, would sometimes pitch together some, you know, production ideas. And, and it was really a collaborative process for all of us to work on the structure and work on the, the sonic approach. And it was, it was really beautiful. And we didn't get done in a few weeks by any means. So I think I went out four times. Uh, and each time I was there for two to three weeks and that's just what we did. And then we would, I'd be going out and performing and we'd come in and listen and move structures around. And, um, and then I started uh, filling the arrangements out and we recorded, uh, we did a session with six cellos. We did two choir sessions, one in a cathedral in Paris and another one in Brussels uh, we did, uh, I think we had six brass players. Um, and then we did a couple percussion sessions and an owned Martineau session. So we started to fill out the rest of the arrangements and then over months, you know, continued to, to work on the mixes. And so it was really great. And it was, it was for my first record making experience, I loved having people and just not being alone. You know, I'm sure that there's plenty of people that they're just locking themselves away and hmm. they don't have any help and that's just how they do it. And maybe I'll do that someday. But this process was, it was so great to be able to, to just talk about these things and listen to old records that we loved and listen to recordings of pianos and, talk about what we liked about this recording and what we liked about that and what we didn't like. And just, you know, through this team effort, try to arrive at a, at a vibe and at a sound and, and then it, yeah. And then it, then it emerged. And then three years later it came out. <laughs> yeah. It took, it took a minute. Yeah. Yeah. That, man, that's such a, such a process. Hey, cause you know, a lot of people don't understand the work that goes into creating a masterpiece like that. You know, it's absolutely no different to a writer sitting down for two years and creating their masterpiece. And what I'm particularly interested in with, with your whole process is when you strip it down to the bare bones of what you're trying to achieve, it all goes back to feeling. And, you know, what, what we know about humanity now is that whether we like it or not, we are purely emotional beings. Like everything is emotional to us. And, and you're right. I think that, you know, the greatest musicians, people like Miles Davis, for them, it, it, it was about the feeling of the music. Uh, there's this, there's this brilliant quote when he was describing Herbie Hancock and how he sounded, I think it was in his autobiography, but nothing technical. He just said, when it came to Herbie, the shit was good as a motherfucker. And that's all he said. Right. And, and it's like, it's like, there's nothing technical in that, but what he's saying is it felt good and it sounded good. Right. And I'm very interested in, in why you think music gives us such an emotional, sometimes even a, a religious experience of, of feeling the emotions that the, that the, well, I guess it's different for everyone, like because I might not feel the same thing that you feel going into creating your album while I'm listening to it. But but why do we receive such emotional responses to music? I have no idea. I have <laughs> I have books sitting on my shelf that I think 
discuss this very question and I have not read them yet, but um, something about, you know, the way we hear and the connection of music to the brain. Um, I could maybe know, even phrase it in a different way if you like. Sure, sure. What do you think the role of music is <clears throat> in a particularly good movie? So, you know, we go to see a movie and we think what we're seeing is what we see, but yeah. what it's what we're seeing is actually what we see interacting with what we hear. And mm. so often music bridges the, the gaps between what we see and what we feel, right? So, so what is it about music that adds to a great story? Oh man, that's a very big question that I'm so... <laughs> Not qualified to speak you on you're, you're an incredible <laughs> composer. You've worked on these brilliant movies. And, you know, the, I, I want to know, like, yeah, what, what is it to you, your process when you go into create a great score? Like, what what is it that you're trying to achieve there? Well, I can, yeah, I can, that I, I suppose I can speak a little bit about. For me, composing is really about listening. and with film score, I think I'm, I've just been so affected by movies and growing up in the, in the eighties and growing up with star Wars and back to the future and blade runner and ET and Indiana Jones, um, you know, and, and, and the Goonies. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's like, it was an amazing time for, for cinema and, and for, film scores you know mm. i i don't know that a lot of those movies would be what they are without the music well i'm sure uh, that everybody listening to this including myself as you're listing off those movies we might not necessarily be thinking about the specific uh scenes in the movie but we're thinking about the theme right but but you know like we're, we're thinking about the music that connects our emotions to the storyline right mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so if I have a film, then my job is to turn off the music and watch it and react and try to be sensitive to what might, what lo like kind of longing might arise in me in terms of how I want it to feel. Do I want it to have more of a sense of action or adventure or mystery or tension or love or soaring you know all of those things i need to be able to track internally in myself right so my body is a laboratory and i'm just trying to be sensitive to the signals that it's it's telling me and then kind of process that through a combination of i don't know trying to get it what emotionally feels good and what intellectually might be appropriate. I mean, coming back to talking about Michael Dana, he was, I remember he, he, there was a film and he was really struggling to find the intellectual way in because once you find the intellectual way in, it tells you about instrumentation. It tells you about what era of music, when, when talking about standing on the shoulders of giants, your intellectual way in is your map of, what giants am I gonna stand on? How am I gonna stand on them? And that informs so much. It can inform the sense of pace, the instrumentation, the, the, stru the musical structure, the kind of chords that you're using, um, the kind of scales you might be using. I mean, all of those things have an intellectual underpinning that can make sense. And when you find that, it's a, such a huge relief. You feel like you've kind of cracked the code of the film. And then your job is to channel your emotions through it. And I remember he was struggling trying to find his way in with this film score. And I just remember, and I said to him, don't you just want to sit down and write something that feels right? It just feels emotionally right. And he was like, no, <laughs> I didn't understand it. And it was through, it was on that film. And I remember he came out one day and he said, I did it. I figured it out. He told me what it was. And I just thought, wow, I never would have thought that, but I saw the value in it. And, and I think that is then a structure. You still have to hit at the right emotion, but then you have a container for it. Um, so 
I, I've adopted that. And when a movie comes and hits my desk, my job is to find an angle with it, mm. an angle that, that makes sense intellectually and then channel what I feel I want to be feeling in those scenes and try to scratch at it. And I'm not always right, by the way. I mean, you know, as, as composers, you know, we get to, um, we get to sit back and have most of the world hear our last version, you know, or the best version. Uh, the world doesn't hear all of the other versions that end up on the cutting room floor. And it's, it's sometimes a lot of uh, trial and error. And sometimes I'm so convinced of something, but a director's like, no, no, it's totally wrong. Or maybe the director is convinced about something and the producer is like, no, no. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird process making a film score. Sometimes you don't have that many cooks in the kitchen, but sometimes there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And when there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, chances of things getting really diluted and difficult go up. But, you know, in the end, I think for me, using the right techniques, the right instrumentation, um, and arriving at the right emotion is, it, it, it's worked for me in so many experiences that I've had. And I want to say that it's arriving at that point with the most simple, um, the, the kind of taking the simplest route musically. You know, you think about James Bond. I mean, John Barry was another huge influence. And it's uh, somebody I, I grew up loving James Bond scores. And Dances with Wolves is one of my all-time favorite scores. And his music That's is good. so yeah. simple and so beautiful. And Braveheart is another one. I mean, these are getting into 90s movies. But, you know, I was, I was still in high school when these movies were coming out and still developing a relationship with them. And I mean, Braveheart and Last of the Mohicans and um, and Dancers with Wolves. I mean, especially Dancers with Wolves, like that score just transports me. Yeah. And it's actually Incredible. quite simple. I mean, a lot of John Barry's compositions are quite simple and they're so effective for me and they're stirring. And, you know, you we, we think about the texture, the complex textures of you know, John Williams um, and, you know, and some of the schools that, that some of his music comes from, Stravinsky and, and things that, that are a bit more verbose and complex. And, you know, I think that there's moments that seem memorable, but it's just a tune. It's a memorable tune, you know? We think about E.T., da da na 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 hmm. You know, or we can... So, or back to the future da, na, 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 na. you know these things are, are iconic because we can sing along and going back to what your your kind of first iteration of the question was i started thinking about the human voice and how you know we're sensitive to the tonalities of how we communicate with each other and even if we're not using words you know how animals communicate you can tell when an animal is angry or when an animal is um you know experiencing love i mean it might sound a lot different for different animals but we can recognize these things and i think that there's just an inherent we're attuned just genetically to receive signals um, with sound in a way that it's a very highly developed sense. I mean, we the nuances that we can detect in the way that someone delivers a line, in the way that uh, a musician plays a phrase, it's like we are so attuned. It's like you can have the same thing said and it, sound, and it delivers a certain energy and the same exact words delivered another way delivers another kind of energy. Hmm. And... I think that music is is playing with that. It's playing with one of the most highly developed senses that we have, and it's it's so sensitive and and therefore, when you manipulate it to to create an emotional response to maximize the emotional response, 
you can really blow it out for the human system. I mean, it can be a completely arresting experience to hear something that just, it gets past all of the words and the conscious mind, all of the thoughts, all of the worldly things, and it can just speak in a, in a, in a, on a level that kind of nothing else can. And I've just had so many transcendent, you know, spiritual nearly experiences listening to music that like, yeah, like I said, I just, I couldn't resist. Hmm. Um, anyway, I just, yeah. I feel like I'm rambling so much. No, no, no. Questions There's so getting. much good stuff in there. Trust me. And <laughs> And so, so what I'm what I'm getting from this is that that the the process of adding to a movie instead of subtracting from it is is a process of having a finely tuned balance between an intellectual respect for the the tradition of the music and and where it should be coming from, and also a a, a respect for your ability as a human being to bring something out of your own emotional resources and and bring something beautiful that can can be new and you know you're so right about sometimes the most simplistic music is the stuff that sticks with us i mean i i'm thinking of dances with wolves because that's so if i'm not mistaken is that is that where it is like yeah that's one of yeah one of those beautiful pieces yeah uh, yeah, yeah, there's a do, few things in there. Do you think that that people can over intellectualize music to the point where it's not about where where it removes itself from that level of connection to humanity? For sure. And all you have to do is is listen to compositions from <laughs> from college graduates, uh, you know that, that might. <laughs> be studying, uh, you know, classical composition, modern classical composition, um, you know, and, and I'm not trying to throw shade, like they, they're doing things that I don't even understand, but, you know, I, I've, I've listened to a few, you know, enough uh, new music concerts and it, it, I, I, I don't, if I, if I feel anything from it, I feel annoyed um, because I don't feel like I'm being really emotionally connected with. I feel like it's this hyper intellectualization of some, whatever the subject matter is that the composition is based on. And I feel like the composer kind of holds the audience hostage and almost at gunpoint, you know, you are going to sit through this and you are going to listen to all of my little musical acrobatics that I'm going to do, and you're going to clap at the end of it. And I'm left so cold, um, and that's not to say that I've never been affected or that I appreciate those things, but I'm, my relationship to music is, is an emotional one, and that mm. trumps everything else. So I don't care how simple a piece of music might be. If it speaks to me, if it does something for me, if it gives me goosebumps, then to me, it's trading on the currency that that I am interested in in the world of music, and if it's kind of intellectual musical masturbation, um, I, I'm not I'm not so interested. And, and you know that was one of the things that I, I don't want to say that I've left the jazz world, but after you know, studying a, a little bit of jazz piano in college and being around other jazz players and playing in bands and stuff. Um, I got so tired of solos. You know, solos are kind of like people just trying to, to flex and, and show things that they've practiced and how hard they've woodshed. And I'm kind of flipping on, on maybe a sentiment that I had earlier in our conversation. But I, I remember I got to a point where I just thought I would rather listen to a pop song. And if there's a solo, it's like edited from 20 solos to make the perfect solo. So the phrasing is just right. And it almost becomes more of a classical composition. Mm. I would rather hear that. I would rather hear things that people really spent time on than just kind of noodling. 
Um, and that was one of the reasons that I, I also felt that, that that helped get me into film score and and helped me and maybe it's just my own justification for being a shitty jazz player but it helped me say you know my space is is not on a stage jamming with other people it's it's in my studio where i can take my time to try and really get at just the right emotion of what it is that i want to say and try to make that statement in a very economical and hopefully interesting way i'm always trying to challenge myself to not regurgitate what someone else has done but rather try to chew on that and and respond to it and hopefully my response is is not just a regurgitation but but hopefully it it it's adding something that's what i'm striving for at least um yeah yeah no that that's beautiful and it man it's so true what you're saying about this kind of mental masturbation right because it exists within every single study, with every career, whatever it is. And, and you just reminded me of, you know, studying jazz and we subconsciously know this as musicians, that it's not purely an intellectual pursuit because when somebody gets on the bandstand and all that they're doing is playing as fast as they can, playing as many licks as they can, playing as many, um, you know, interesting little ways to get around the tune that they can. I know the feeling of sitting in the audience and looking to your friend next to you and thinking, Oh, when is he going to get down from that? You know, like we, we subconsciously know that it's such a disrespect to get up there and think that you can just make good music by purely having an intellectual advantage because it's not about that. It's, it's about the combination as, as we've talked about of the respect for tradition and also for just making it feel good. Like Miles Davis, uh, like you mentioned before, kind of blue that album, it's not like he's expressing any crazy chops that he has for, for getting quickly around changes or, or make, it's a very simple album, but completely perfect balance of the tradition and the, and the emotional aspect there, which is so beautiful. But I, I love that you share that. And, 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 and I wanted to maybe uh, for the final kind of question or two jump over. I know that you mentioned you, uh, have you know read stoicism and you've been interested in it to a certain degree i don't know to what degree um yeah to what degree has philosophy or stoicism played in i guess your direction or or anything in your life uh well i've i, I think i've always been drawn to learning about philosophy and learning about religions um I've, I've cracked open my fair share of, of books on both of those subjects. Not that I've necessarily finished all the books that I've cracked, but, um, you know, Seneca, I've read a bit of Marcus Aurelius. I've read a bit of, um, you know, I don't think Rumi is a, is a stoic, but that's somebody that I was uh, reading a lot of after I got out of high school and in high school discovered Rumi. And, um, you know, I've read a bit of the Old Testament. I've read a bit of the New Testament. I've read a bit of Buddhism. I've, I've, I took an Indian philosophy class in college. Um, you know, the thing that uh, Viktor Frankl I've read, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are maybe stoicism adjacent um, yeah. that have, have always been very fascinating and you know I, I think that whenever there's a philosophy or a religion it's a bit like the blind man and the elephant you know and and people who try to describe you know you, you know that example right every there's a bunch of blind men and they they all are holding a different part of the elephant and so when they describe the elephant Someone is holding the ear and says, ah, oh, it's not a lot. It's long and flat and flappy. And someone else is holding the side. And it's like, no, it's like a massive big brick wall. And someone's holding the trunk. Everyone has their own perspective on truth. Uh, but perspective is subjective. And so that doesn't, to me, that, that simultaneously discounts 
anyone's perspective on anything as, as being total truth. And yet at the same time, I, I think that it can uh, almost, um, you know, prove that, that the, I, I think that there's something of worth for how people view their reality. Even if it's totally something that I think is backwards and messed up. You know, I think it's important to to listen to people and I don't want to get political, but I think that's the breakdown of our ability to have meaningful discussion face to face is one of the reasons that we have cancel culture. It's one of the reasons that we have far right wing white supremacists. It's one of the reasons that we have, you know, Bernie and people who aren't going to vote because Bernie's not the candidate and other people who are voting for Trump. It's like there's just it's just polarizing, right? And I think that um, there, people rarely ever think of themselves as evil. They always look and point the finger to something else and say, well, that's evil. And I know that that's evil because I'm convinced of what I think. And I think I'm going to point the finger out there. And, you know, I, I think that there's, we're, we're, we are unable, our human equipment processes raw data and turns it into subjectivity, turns it into a narrative about reality. We don't actually interact with true reality. We don't see true light. We see a limited band of the light spectrum. Hmm. And the way that our eyes perceive light is the same way that our brain perceives truth. Um, and stoicism is very much about... Um, Well, I don't want to, I, don't, I, I, I'm not even learned enough to say what I think stoicism is about, but the way that those readings have affected me is it's about my metric. It's not about the world's metric and it's mm. about being somewhat resilient to not just the happenings of the world, but potentially the happenings within my own brain. So one of the things that I think about music is as much as I've had groundbreaking experiences personally listening to music, it, it gives me hope. It helps me work through things. It helps me process my emotions, not just creating it, but listening to it. Um, I think it's also one of the biggest distractions that a human being can, can have. Um, I, I, I think that meditation, which not listening to music, not listening to a guided meditation, not even repeating a mantra, but just being. And the closest thing I think is just to pay attention to your breath. Mm. And I think that's the most kind of raw dog meditation approach that I know about. Um, that develops the muscle of dopamine resistance and <clears throat> music gives you dopamine, you know, video games, sex, mm. food, being right, you know, having the intellectual position that like, I know something and therefore I'm in control of my own reality and, or I won that argument or, Oh, I called this person out on their shit or I, you know, all of these things are, I, I believe that as humans, we're, we're stimulus response machines and we, go, we are genetically programmed to go after the greatest stimulus response that we can, that is afforded to us. So whether that's developing a skill, getting a ripped body or, you know, being a gourmet chef or being a billionaire, whatever that is, we put these, we lock away a certain release that then we claw for. And this happens in music. This happens in music development. This happens in, in music creation. This happens with winning awards. This happens with getting jobs. Like nowhere can humans hide from this. And I think stoicism is um, philosophically, I think one of the, the better cases for developing a self that is outside of the peaks and valleys of the dopamine ride, um, you know, and when people feel down, then they they seek it, you know, through companionship and through food and through 
it could be, you know, sex, even if that's with just yourself, it's like, those are all coping mechanisms. And coping mechanisms because we're having a difficult time dealing with reality. And I think that stoicism is kind of like, just sit there and be with it. You know, mm -hmm. sit there and deal with it. You know, rely on yourself. Don't rely on other metrics. Hold true to your values and your principles, despite what the outside world might be pushing you to do or say. And this is, to me, uh, an incredibly useful and noble philosophical path to try and hold because especially now the algorithms i call them the algorithms but you know mm. we're we whatever our job is the algorithms and, and technology are closing in more and more and the algorithms are detecting what gives us a stimulus response and they will in turn feed that back to us so we're in these like ever intensifying uh stimulus loops and the rate at which we can get stimulated um, is going up and up and up so our ability to exist outside of them is also proportionately going down and you see that with how addicted we are to our phones and checking instagram and checking social media and being plugged in and all these things it spins up all of these it's it spins up the dopamine loop um so i value it because i i personally feel so much better when i'm not on that ride when i'm not desperately trying to get a dopamine hit and look i'm i'm not i'm not perfect i'm 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 there with every other person that is hooked to my phone and <laughs> hooked to my email and all of these things but i try to fight against it and so reading the stoics meditating um and and exercise and actually fasting too anything that pulls me away from the dopamine loop is um in my opinion uh it's it's very valuable i think the only danger is if i go too far extreme into that and i don't give myself enough of it then i get into danger of F collapsing back into it you know because i feel like i've been too deprived and it's like ah you know screw it i want to live and what's life if i can't like binge on donuts and play video games and sleep <laughs> all day long or yeah. you know whatever that looks like to to any of us but um uh, yeah I, that's 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 kind of my view and, and relationship to it i i really appreciate it all of that. I don't even want to ask a follow-up question there. I just want people to listen to that on repeat because what's just happened is that a musician has just taught us so much about how to implement stoicism. Uh, and, you know, I didn't even know uh, before the interview that you had studied stoicism, but um, seriously, if people listen to that answer enough times, they'll get so much good stuff out of there in terms of how they should be implementing stoicism into their life. So I want to thank you so much. Um, yeah, Rob, I know that we can, you know, continue this conversation for hours and I'd love to have you back on in the future, but thanks so much for, um, for coming on. And is there anywhere that you'd like people to go, uh, in terms of finding your music or, uh, is there any way that my audience can support you? Uh, well, um, yeah, it, it's, my music is everywhere. The, the album is available. Um, physically you can purchase a CD there's vinyl you can purchase a vinyl if you're into that mm. I also uh, wrote and directed three music videos that accompany the album and if you haven't checked out those that's also another insight into um, you know they're, they're they're wordless they're very archetypal and there's actually some some elements of of stoicism that may have kind of subconsciously made their way into that mm. but if you watch the three of those, uh, there, it's like a three act narrative, basically with, uh, it starts out with a, a person that has kind of walked away from themselves and gone through a journey of distractions of the world. And in the end, they come back and realize that what they've been searching for their whole, the whole time has, has been within themselves. I kind of mm. gave the whole thing away, but because your podcast is about stoicism, I, I do think that there's a relevant aspect there so perhaps your audience would be interested in viewing those and those are on youtube 
Mm-hmm. Um, and otherwise, anything that I release will will be up on you know I, Spotify and and Apple Music and um, pretty easy to find. And you can follow me on social media for any announcements. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rob. I appreciate you being here. Thanks so much, man. I really enjoyed it. So there's my interview for you with Rob Simonson. Now, I'm sure that you guys got so much out of that, just like I did. And make sure you jump online, listen to his album, and uh, and check out everything that he's done because he's a fascinating guy and we want to have him back many more times. So I hope that you've enjoyed this episode and I'm going to talk to you guys next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.